Well, well thank you. Um, <laughs> the subcommittee will come to order. So that's what you do in Washington, D.C., by the way, when you start a hearing. I sincerely want to thank everybody for coming out here today, for joining us. It's a beautiful day, truly, in Montana and here in, uh, in Deer Lodge, especially. Uh, now, we haven't done exhaustive research on this fun fact, but we do believe that this is the first time, at least in the modern history of the United States Senate, that a hearing has been held in a barn, <laughs> which is kind of fun. Uh, as some of you know, I am the, the chairman of the National Parks Subcommittee in the United States Senate, which I'm honored to, to, uh, to have that role. And uh, that is a subcommittee of the Energy and National, National Resor Natural Resources, the full committee of the U.S. Senate. I want to extend a, a special appreciation to the staff here at Grand Course, which has just been wonderful as we've been working to get this set up, including who you just heard from, Superintendent Lavelle, as well as Alan Stewart, the facilities manager, Julie Crolio, the chief of interpretation education, all of whom put in a lot of extra time and hours to make this hearing a possibility. I know that you went above and beyond, and I really like to thank you for all that you do. It is so appreciated. And today is a special day because we have the opportunity to bring the official work of the United States Senate here to Montana. I can tell you there is nothing different in terms of the way the process works from a hearing being held on Capitol Hill, where everybody's in suits and ties and so forth, or being here in a barn in Powell County. There's no difference in terms of the way this process will work, uh, the official uh, weight of this kind of a hearing, the way we'll record the testimony and so forth is exactly the same as it would be in Washington, D.C., except I would argue it's a whole lot better out here in a bar. Now, I think there are some folks in D.C. that got concerned is well, you don't have air conditioning, <laughs> right? Jackie right. probably heard that concern, yes, right? that is true. Right. Well, this is why we love to call Montana home, don't we? In terms of uh, even on the warmer days in August, we can have a, a hearing here in a barn and be, uh, and be pretty comfortable. I also want to um, uh, thank uh, staff here that came from Washington, D.C., two staff members of the uh, Energy and Natural Resources Committee, and uh, Michelle, <laughs> Michelle, maybe see she's got my back. So uh, <laughs> Michelle Lane, who was here from Washington D.C., as well as Darla Rajinsky, who was here. So these are both members of the committee back in Washington D.C. And thank you for making the trip out here. I've already heard rave reviews from the staff saying, "I can't believe how amazing this place is." And uh, I think you, they maybe talked into canceling the return trips to Washington, D.C., <laughs> which I wouldn't blame you one bit. Well, growing up in Montana, like many of us here in this room, uh, spending time outdoors, getting out in the backcountry, all the time fishing, that's just what we do and, and what I did as a kid. Uh, some of you may know I went to kindergarten to college over in Bozeman. My dad went to the University of Montana for college. In fact, my mom was pregnant with me, put my dad through school once upon a time working at the Missoula Merck back in the, uh, the early 60s. Uh, but I was lucky enough to grow up in the shadows of Yellowstone National Park. Um, and our family, like uh, many of you, we back in those days used to hop in the Griswold Station wagon and Dad would load up me and my two sisters, and, uh, and we would get on the road across Montana. Uh, we love to visit parks all over the western part of the country, but the Montana parks were always home for me as a, as a Bozeman kid, as a Montana kid. But what I learned from that experience in those visits, whether it's a small family road trip, or maybe it's a busload of folks coming the Big Sky Country from around the U.S. or even overseas. We're seeing increasingly more overseas visitors coming to our parks here in Montana and around the country. These visitors have a huge economic impact on gateway communities. We know that over five and a half million people visited national parks in Montana 
last year. Now think about that. That's five times our state's population that came to Montana to visit our parks last year. They spent approximately, and I'm not sure how we can tally that up easily, but we make some good guesstimates, approximately $633 million in local gateway regions, which supports over 9,500 jobs and generates over $880 million in the Montana economy alone. And while we do know that the majority of these visitors went to Glacier and Yellowstone, we are here today to talk about other parks in our state that also contributed that number, like Greg Kors. Of the 5.5 million visitors that came to see parks in Montana last year, 26,700 came here to Grand Course Ranch National Historic Site. You can see we have a lot of upside potential. <laughs> that is probably the understatement of the hearing here, I would say. Um, well, that's not a huge number. And we're going to spend time today talking about what we can do to increase that number. These visitors did contribute $1.6 million to the local gateway economy here in Deer Lodge as well as supporting 23 jobs. And that is a big deal for a rural community in Montana. Generally speaking, visitation across parks in Montana and across the country has increased over the last decade. We're seeing some trends, I know, as I look at the Yellowstone numbers, as, as chair of the Parks uh, Committee, we look at some of these stats. The shoulder season that we always referred to in Montana, that time when Montana can't quite make up its mind, whether it's winter time or summertime. Somebody said the other day that Montana is nine months of winter and three months of hoping for summer. I heard that. But during the shoulder seasons, that, uh, you know, that April, May time period, or in the fall, which are sometimes the most glorious times of the year, that September, October, November, kind of in between the winter seasons and the summer seasons, we're starting to see a lot of international visitors now coming that are filling in what used to be more of a shoulder season downturn. We're starting to level some of that out. We saw a big spike in visitation as the National Park Service celebrated the centennial in 2016. Along with an increase of visitors, though it does come some challenges. When we look at the fact that the National Park Service has 419 units, of which Grand Corps is one of those, 30% of the visitors, about 318 million nationally, went to only 10 of those units. Now we understand, especially in Montana, that many people have their bucket list of vacation items. That might include a trip to Yellowstone, or landing perhaps a, a nice trout, or a trip to Glacier and driving the Going to the Sun Highway. But I think there's room to expand what folks think of that perfect bucket list vacation spot, like showcasing the beauty and the fun of these other park units in Montana. And that is what we're here to do today. We're here to take a deeper dive into how we can encourage visitors to stop at lesser known parks, like right here at Grand Course. Let's talk about who is best positioned to get the word out and what factors into a visitor's decision making process. <coughs> By encouraging visitors to get out and explore all of Montana's great parks, I think we can create truly a win-win situation. First, visitors might find some new favorites, exploring places they might not have thought to place on an itinerary before. We can also help surrounding towns and communities continue to benefit from increased visitation. And lastly, we can help spread the visitation between parks, which can help with this growing backlog of maintenance on our national parks. One of the bills we're working on right now, one of my highest priorities in the National Parks Subcommittee, is to address this issue of the, the maintenance backlog we have. It's nearly $13 billion of infrastructure backlog, maintenance backlog. And as Angus King, who's the ranking member of this committee, the uh, senator from Maine, we, we, uh, we spent a lot of time together uh, working on national park issues. He said we should think about backlog maintenance as debt, and we owe it to our national parks to invest in them. They are treasures, and it's a bill that I hope we can get passed and put on the president's desk yet this Congress. 
So whether we're pushing legislation to fix this massive maintenance backlog, which is impacting our visitation in national parks, like this, it's called the Restore Our Parks Act, or to work to bring awareness to the challenges that gateway communities of parks face, like we did at last year's field hearing in Gardner. So we had a field hearing in, in Gardner, Montana. We looked at the constraints we have in a place like Gardner, places like Cook City, places like West Yellowstone, where oftentimes we're landlocked. You know, we're surrounded by federal lands, and yet these communities need to expand. Uh, we need to be able to provide employee housing, and we're running into some challenges there. Uh, but I can tell you the fielding and gardener was not in a barn. It was in a school. But Montana's parks have been a priority of mine since day one in Congress, so I'm grateful to be here today. Before we move forward, I'd like to remind everyone that this is an official United States Senate hearing. Uh, I will briefly introduce each of the witnesses, and then each witness will have five minutes to provide their testimony. Following the testimony, I will ask questions during which time each witness will have up to five minutes to respond. If you've ever watched one of these hearings on C-SPAN, you know, it's probably a really slow day if you're watching C-SPAN. <laughs> I think the only person who watches C-SPAN is my mom, I think, in case I'm there. But um, if you watch C-SPAN, uh, you'll see we'll conduct this hearing the same way. Um, one thing I will be able to do, and, and I'll, I'll be asking questions, I will be asking the witnesses, when they speak, they'll have up to five minutes to respond. But because we aren't in Washington today, I'm not going to be too strict with the timer. But we will try to keep this on time as best we can, as we want to try to respect your time as well. Once we finish up with the questions, I will gavel the hearing out like we do in D.C. And one last reminder, as this is an official hearing of the United States Senate, there are no questions from the audience in an official U.S. Senate hearing. Everything said here today will be included in the official record. Thank you for being here to take the official record, uh, just like we do in Washington, D.C. Appreciate it. So uh, let's get on to the witnesses. It's now time to hear from our witnesses who are sitting uh, to my right. Joining us this afternoon are Mr. Palmer Chip Jenkins, the Acting Regional Director of the Mountain <coughs> Region National Park Service. Welcome. The Honorable Doug Cratchit, Commissioner, Powell County, Montana. Thanks for being here, Commissioner. Uh, Ms. Sarah Bannon, Executive Director of Southwest Region, Montana Office of Tourism and Business Development. Welcome. And Ms. Toby O'Rourke, President and CEO of Campgrounds of America, Inc. You might know that better as KOA. I want to thank you all for, begin, for uh, being here with us. At the end of your testimony, we'll begin questions. Your full written testimony will be made part of this official hearing record. And uh, Mr. Jenkins, um, I'll allow you to uh, kick this off. Thank Please you. proceed. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Chairman Daines, thank you for the opportunity to present the Department of Interior's views on the topic of expanding visitors to let visitation to lesser known parks. I'd like to uh, summarize my statement. Uh, this full one is submitted for the record. I'd also like to request that Grand Coors Ranch Superintendent Jackie Lavelle be allowed to assist me in answering questions. Without objection. Thank you. On a personal note, uh, I've worked for the National Park Service for over three decades, starting as a ranger at North Cascades National Park. I first visited Grand Coors Ranch when I was superintendent at Fort Clatsop National Memorial, um, which is a turnaround spot on the Lewis and Clark Trail on the Oregon coast. Uh, we were, at the time, we were preparing for the bicentennial celebration of the Lewis and Clark expedition in the early 2000s. Uh, my wife and my two young sons and I were spending time exploring the Lewis and Clark Trail, one of the lesser known sites of uh, Montana. And we were spending time working our way through Montana on the trail. We stopped here at Great Coors uh, on the spur of the moment when we saw the sign and decided to take a break. Uh, we thought it was gonna be a short stop, make use of the restroom. It actually turned into almost a full day visit. We were captivated by the history of ranching in Montana. The stories of ranch life, the magnitude of the operation of the ranch, my kids especially enjoyed learning how to rope glass only woody wooden sphere. Uh, this was a visit that was fun and educational, it, but it also helped me as a National Park Service manager continue to learn about the untapped potential that our lesser known parks have and what they can offer to visitors. Each and every unit of the National Park System, no matter its size, location, special features, or number of visitors, contributes to the fabric of American life and offers visitors an opportunity to experience an important aspect of our shared heritage, 
The National Park Service saw record-breaking visitation in 2016, our centennial year when visitation topped 330 million. But visitation growth has varied among parks. Some of the lesser known parks have had less growth, even declines in visitation. The National Park Service has been working in a variety of ways, many in collaboration with partners, to promote lesser visited parks. Here at Green Corps, visitation has grown from about 20,000 to 26,000 annually over the last decade. The key to this increase has been building relationships with partners throughout the region, including Powell County, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, and local and regional tourism groups. The park offers unique events, such as the annual Pumpkin Sunday event, Hang with the Horses and the Holiday Open House. The park has agreements with the Draft Horse Expo, and it partners with the Rialto Community Theater and hosts local community events, like last night's movie with the Ranger and Evenings at the Ranch. Programs provide visitors with activities in the evenings, but this also encourages people staying in the hotels and camping to visit the town and support local restaurants and shops. Nationally, we have programs to attract visitors to lesser visited parks. In 2015, the National Park Service and National Park Foundation launched the public engagement cam campaign called Find Your Park as an initiative for the 2016 centennial. Find Your Park continues today through traditional advertising in key markets, digital and social media advertising, and special events and programs. Another centennial initiative was the Every Kid in a Park program, now called Every Kid Outdoors. This program provides free passes to parks and public lands to fourth graders and their families. For smaller sites that do not charge entrance fees, the significance of the program has been the associated help for providing transportation and programming from nonprofit partner organizations. This is a successful initiative that has introduced a lot of fourth graders and their families to national parks. Yet another program that began in the centennial is our community volunteer ambassadors. These are youth volunteers who help with volunteer programs that introduce people to the parks. At least 20% of these ambassadors are placed in lesser visited parks. The National Park Service has also made great strides in increasing the visibility of lesser visited parks through digital and social media. Our websites are regularly upgraded with trip suggestions, thematic itineraries, and tools to guide people to park experience based on their interests and activities. It's a great way for potential park visitors to discover experiences available at parks they may never have heard of. We hope to continue to build on all of these efforts to make more visitors aware of the lesser known parks and these National Park Service gems. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. Superintendent Lavelle and I would be pleased to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Commissioner. Well, thank you, Senator Danes, for having this hearing at Grant Coors. Deer Lodge, and Powell County. I'll start by giving a little bit of history for the county. But Powell County originated by being split off of Deer Lodge County in 1901. The county seat of Powell County is Deer Lodge. Agriculture has been and still is the main economic business in Powell County. Mining was a major industry in the county until approximately 1990 when the last major mine, the phosphate mine, shut down, eliminating many jobs. Another mine-related business, the smelter in Anaconda, employed many Powell County residents. Until the Milwaukee Railroad closed in 1980, a roundhouse was located in Deer Lodge, which employed many good-paying jobs. Approximately 49% of Powell County is federal government owned, the vast majority being the U.S. Forest Service, minor percentages, BLM, and the Park Service. Logging in Powell County was a very active industry until the political and management climate curtailed almost all timber harvesting on federal land. Now the county must rely on SRS payments as a major funding source instead of logging as income from non-taxable federal land. One of the few sawmills left in the state is located here in Deer Lodge and it is still a major employer in the area, but the majority of the trees are not harvested in Powell County. Deer Lodge is midway between Glacier and Yellowstone off of Interstate 90, one of the main corridors between these two national parks. Powell County has many recreational activities that now attract people from both in and out of the state of Montana. Fishing is excellent on the Clark Fork, Blackfoot, and Little Blackfoot rivers, Georgetown Lake, and many of the smaller streams and lakes in the county. 
Hunting is also very popular. Elk, deer, antelope, bear, and predators are all able to be hunted locally. The northern portion of the county is in the Bob Marshall Wilderness, limiting economic activity to recreation. The territorial prison, constructed before Montana became a state, is located in Deer Lodge and is a major tourist attraction for the area, along with the car museum and the hobby shop, which sells innate produced items. The Continental Divide Trail runs the length of the eastern boundary of Powell County. Powell County has acquired the old Milwaukee Railroad bed between Deer Lodge and Garrison, a distance of approximately eight miles, and also very instrumental is the Grand Coors Ranch with this. We're doing it as a future extension to the Arrowstone Park and trail system within the city of Deer Lodge. Hiking and biking trails are becoming very popular as a tourist attraction. A nine-hole golf course is located just outside of town, and the Jack Nicklaus-designed Old Works golf course is just a few miles away in Anaconda. These activities are all draws that are available for tourists to enjoy along with visiting Grant Coors Ranch. Powell County recently added a commercial kitchen to the Blue Ribbon Pavilion located on the Powell County Fairgrounds that has a capability of serving around 500 people. Obtaining functions at the pavilion also encourages attendees to also enjoy the other activities available as hiking, golfing, and Grant Coors. Deer Lodge City Powell County Airport is in the process of being expanded with the assist assistance of the FAA. Advertising is important, as tourists must be aware of what is available and having the area presented as an interesting destination to get them to stop and enjoy the amenities. Social media and websites are popular and widely used. Many tourists plan to visit Montana obtaining brochures from the State Tourism Office. Being included in these brochures is a benefit. Advertising in travel magazines and placing information at resorts, campgrounds, and RV parks is beneficial. And the old standby of attractive billboards placed on the highways still bring attention to local attractions to traveling tourists, tempting them to stop. And I thank you very much, Senator, for having me here to testify. Thanks, Commissioner. Appreciate it. Ms. Bannon. I'm Sarah Bannon, Executive Director of Southwest Montana. We are a contractor with the state for marketing the nine counties in Southwest Montana. Um, Senator Gaines, I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you and to be a part of this hearing. Montana has over 2.3 million non-residents come to the state. Yeah, so that was the number for 2018. 84% of these people plan to return to Montana within two years. Of the non-resident visitors surveyed who came to Paul County, 70% of those people went to Yellowstone National Park. 57% of those people went to Glacier National Park. And 71% of the people coming to Paul County said they were looking for other historical sites. Now, if we could get more of the National Park travelers coming to the Grand Corps Ranch and the Big Hole National Battlefield National Historic Sites, it would take some of the pressure off the National Park's overflow and reduce the impact on the environment. So what are the, some of the ways that we drive Montana tourism? Of course, we have print advertising, um, billboards strategically placed, travel guide, website, social media, and with our partnerships like with Deer Lodge, we do cooperative grants and community quarter grants. We do brochures. And regionally, we have the travel guide, a tear-off map, a website, video for the website, social birding brochure, which features, our first feature on the birding brochure is Grand Coors Ranch. So, um, we would like to um, give more exposure right in the national parks, uh, and they're so willing to bring people to the other um, parts in the state and in our region and into these national historic sites. 
So we need to get them the information to get them to funnel more people over to this um, wonderful site here. So Jackie Babel, the superintendent, super superintendent, she has created the largest event in Deer Lodge with Pumpkin Sunday. This event brings in 5,000 people into a slower shoulder season. She's excited the town to piggyback on the event, and now they are doing their own fall festival along with the Pumpkin Sunday. She has all kinds of events, movies at the theater, birding, trail hikes, and runs. Jackie is so willing to do anything she can, can to build interest in Grant Park's ranch, and she is doing a fabulous job at this. As you know, um, Southwest Montana considers this historic ranch a main attraction, not only in Montana, but in the country, as it is the way of life that is too often forgotten. School field trips are regular here to educate children on the actual history of the cattle industry and life on the frontier. Adults from all over are jolted into a glimpse of the past trials and tribulations forged in this way of life. Southwest Montana markets the Grand Course Ranch through the regional travel guide along with um, influencers where we bring writers in to come and write about their experiences here. We look forward to helping with more marketing exposure for the Grand Course Ranch historic site and continued work with um, Superintendent Jackie LaBelle. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Ben. Mr. Rohr. Thank you, Senator, for having me here and KOA represented at this hearing today. I appreciate the invitation to discuss the topic of expanding visitation in our parks, specifically to lesser known parks, as it has a direct overlap to our business. My name is Toby O'Rourke. I'm the president and CEO of Campgrounds of America, um, as you said, KOA. We're the world's largest network of privately owned campgrounds with nearly 520 locations across the United States and Canada. We were founded in 1962 in Billings, and our headquarters remain there today. The majority of our campgrounds are franchises that are privately owned and operated, and they partner with us primarily for marketing and brand awareness, but also program support and technology. We at KOA Inc. also own 31 locations ourselves in various places across the country. Because of our large footprint, there's a KOA location near most every national park, memorial, monument, or historical society historical site. For example, here in Montana, not only do we have parks surrounding Glacier and Yellowstone, but we also have a campground at the Big Hole National Battlefield, the Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument, and here in Deer Lodge, near this location. Camping is increasingly growing in popularity based on our research report, the North American Camping Report, that we publish annually. We estimate there's 78 million households who consider themselves active campers. And there's been roughly 7.2 million households that have been new to camping over the past five years. 39 million of those camp every year, and the number of annual campers has increased 22% over the past five years. Not only are more people camping, they're camping more frequently. Since 2014, we've seen a 72% growth in households taking three trips a year. I share these numbers because the growing population of campers represents a growing market for national park visitation. We find that most campers use our campgrounds as base camps for exploring the surrounding area. There are several trends worth noting that have an impact on my business that I believe would likewise affect the national parks. Understanding these trends allows us to build effective marketing programs and could help build communication strategies for the parks. One of which is diversity. There's been a significant increase in diversity in camping over the past five years. Our report shows that 29% of camping households are multicultural, and that's a 17-point increase since 2012. New campers are increasingly more diverse. In fact, last year, all new campers that camped for the first time, 51% of those were from minority demographics. Key to attracting more diverse visitors is focusing on representing inclusion in not just marketing, but also in operations and staffing. Secondly, millennials. Younger generations are driving the growth we see in camping. Millennials represent the largest segment of camping households at 41%. That's a seven point increase. Among new campers, 56% were from millennial households. Millennials are a large focus of the travel market in general because they're focused on experience, which is a nice target for the national park. I believe, being a marketer, that it's very difficult to market effectively to a whole generation. And so we like to segment it by life stage. 
And for us, focusing on the millennial family is a very good target that I think overlaps here. Uh, road trips is a trend. Uh, KOA was built on the concept of road trips. Our founder recognized in 1962 people traveling to the Seattle World's Fair and developed a business off of that. Um, what we're seeing now in research that we follow is that road trips are again trending. Um, the portrait of American traveler research shows that the percentage of American travelers taking road trips has increased by 64%, and um, more than two thirds plan to do one in the next year. Close to home, on the other hand, we see one of the most interesting trends in our data is that people are camping closer and closer to home. 70% of campers camp within 150 miles of home, and that's increased 15 points in five years. Our take on this is that people are increasingly busy and time served, um, and why we do market our national destinations, such as the national parks, it's very important to reach out to your local area and let people know what's, what they can go explore. Um, we at, at KOA have a shared interest with you in increasing visitation to all of the national parks, monuments, and historical sites in the system. Not only are we passionate about the benefits of the outdoor experience that are found at these locations, but the livelihood of our small business owners and entrepreneurs that surround these points of interest depend on it. I believe camping households are a prime target for the park system, and we look forward to doing our part to help increase the collective awareness of our national funders. Thank you. Well, that was impressive. You all stayed right within the time limits, too. I'll tell you what, it's great. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Mr. Jenkins. Uh, as you're aware, the Centennial set records across the country. You mentioned that in your testimony in terms of visitation at a number of parks across the country, including places in, Yellow, in Montana like Yellowstone and Glacier. And I know you track those numbers. Uh, as we seek to increase visitation at parks that are currently less well known, like Grand Coors or Little Bighorn Battlefield, we need to ensure these sites have the capacity to meet the needs of increased visitation. I, we talked a little bit and your testimony reflected across witnesses here about the Every Kid Outdoors, the Find Your Park Initiative, which are wonderful. What does anybody do here to get more young people outside? Um, could you explain how the Park Service forecasts visitation in individual park units? You know, how do you prioritize staffing decisions, especially when you have a, the seasonality challenges with staffing? Uh, units, uh, while well, the same time thing with increasing visitation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we, I, I'm not aware that we actually, uh, across the country, forecast increases in visitation. Um, rather, what we do is we rely, uh, we rely upon the superintendents and the staff uh, in their parks, given their local knowledge and the the work that they do with their partners. Uh, to be paying attention to the trends and uh, uh, looking into the future in terms of what uh, what might be coming their way. Are there special events coming, um, commemorations, anniversaries, as well as also larger trends? Um, you are correct in terms of uh, staffing, is a, staffing is a really interesting calculus for superintendents and their leadership teams as they are trying to um, figure out how to manage within fixed budgets and optimize when they need to have uh, staff on in, in order to be able to meet the, the um, visitation curve, if you will. And increasingly what we are seeing is that those visitation curves are both higher and pushing out. So earlier into the spring and earlier into, and later into the fall in terms of uh, parks wanting to have programs uh, to be able to support people coming. And then also, um, uh, many superintendent parks uh, are uh, working closely with local communities, with school districts and educators to run programs that are counter-seasonal, so to uh, when the school year is going on, to be able to host, uh, host kids like they do here at Grand Course to be able to come and to be able to learn about the park. And about um, some of these larger bus tours that we'll see. Um, we see those probably more typically in some of the larger national parks. Uh, how would the National Park Service coordinate with these tour groups? Think about their itineraries. I mean, th this is a hidden gem yep. here. And I think about how increasingly there's a, des there's a desire for the genuine, genuineness of a travel experience. Yep. You know, the off the beaten path and social media can drive some of that as well. 
Uh, we were chatting a little bit with, with staff we're going to have at the Big Bend National Park. Uh, up here, so that find your park hashtag where it just drove tremendous traffic mm -hmm. to a place you had to hike miles even to get to the park. So how, how does the National Park Service work on these itineraries, let's say with these larger tour groups, and how might you um, highlight a place like Grand Course? Sure, with your permission, uh, let me give part of the answer and then I'll turn it over to Jackie to let her talk about some of the things that we're doing here. Um, so uh, at a national level, uh, we have a uh, tourism office that works with the tourism industry um, and that partic participates in things like the International Pow Wow and other trade shows where they get together with the trade industry to, and a specific thing that they do at that time is to try to highlight opportunities in terms of lesser known parks. I think also um, what we realize is that when people are on uh, bus tours and they're visiting uh, Yellowstone or Glacier or Rocky Mountain, they are usually coming from large metropolitan areas and going by places. And so it's, if you will, filling in the hole, filling in the filling in the places on the on the journey. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I like your recognition of that people are looking for authenticity and to be able to go and visit those. And then, um, again, we rely upon local knowledge and local partnerships. Uh, by way of example, when I worked at uh, Lewis and Clark National Park in Astoria, Oregon, we would coordinate with the commercial tour industry where we, um, we would meet with them early in the season and we would provide uh, training for their onboard um, guides. And then we would work with them to try to make sure that uh, the tour buses all didn't show up at 11 o'clock. Uh, and where we would have, you know, um, long lines for the bathroom or trying to see, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the far clats up. Uh, rather, we would work with them to try to set up a schedule so that the uh, buses would arrive um, at uh, intervals so that uh, they would be, both we could handle them within our capacity, but they were also ensuring the quality experience. Uh, let, let's hear from Jackie. 